that last song we sang, that last song we sang, how many of you know who wrote it? Now, I know for sure there are some out there that actually know who wrote the song. The writer of that song was Martin Luther, an instrument, inst <laughs> an instrumental leader in the Reformation movement. In April of 1527, after 10 years of helping to lead in the Reformation movement, a, a, a dizzy spell struck Martin Luther as he was preaching. Things got worse. By July, he wondered how long he had to live. He regained some strength, but then he was assaulted with depression and heart problems and severe intestinal complications. Now, if you know, in those days, the, sometimes the cure was worse than the actual ailment. At one point, he wrote, I spent more than a week in death and hell. My entire body was in pain. He continued, he said, I labored under the vacillations and storms of desperation and blasphemy against God. Which sounds a lot like, to me like Job, who was encouraged by his wife to curse God and die. Then on the top of that, the Black Plague struck Germany and Martin Luther's home became a hospital where he watched friends die. Then he found out that his year-old son became seriously ill. And I don't know about you, but if you were Martin Luther, you had to think to yourself, there is an unstoppable storm that continues to repeatedly attack me. And in the midst of that storm, Martin Luther did what all of us should do. He turned to God's Word. Specifically, he turned to the 26th Psalm, it was one of his favorites, and it, in fact, was in, what inspired him to write, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. That is the psalm I want us to look at today. The 46th psalm is a, is a great psalm. In it, we find strength when we are in the midst of the storms of life. When, when it seems like everything is falling apart around us. Have you ever felt like you were in the midst of the storm? A storm you could not control. Maybe it was a relationship that, that seemed to be crumbling away. Maybe it was a health issue that seemed to just be sapping your strength. Maybe it is the fallen world that, that seems to be conspiring against you. Or maybe the things you felt that you had security in you feel now are at great risk. But I want you to know whatever storm you're going through, it is in those times that a psalm like the 46th Psalm can really get you through. It is in a, that kind of psalm that we can have our eyes open to the possibilities that, that only God can provide for us. It is in Psalm 46 that we can be made aware of the fact that God has a different plan for our life. In fact, I want you to listen to the first three verses of this psalm. Psalm 46, 1 through 3. It says, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. I want to give you a little background to this psalm. Now, I want you to understand right up front, as we look at this biblical history, the psalm itself does not identify the events that led up to it being written. In the psalm, we don't know why it was written. But, that being said, many biblical scholars believe it is referring to to the Assyrian invasion. When, when they invaded Judah and surrounded Jerusalem, and all of this took place about 700 years before Jesus. The vast empire to the north, the Assyrians, led by King Sennacherib, they swarmed like locusts. They went from one nation to another nation to another nation, conquering them one after the other. They finally got to the northern kingdom, 
and it collapsed beneath them, destroyed forever. The southern kingdom was next, and it was attacked. And as they were attacked, some of the cities fell, and then another city fell, and another city fell, until they got to Jerusalem. But Jerusalem stood. It held on. But its citizens were trapped within the walls of the city. Sennacherib said that he had trapped Hezekiah, which is the godly king of Judah. He didn't say that, but that is who he is. He said he had trapped Hezekiah like a caged bird. Sennacherib sent envoys to Hezekiah with terms of surrender, and Hezekiah took that letter to the temple. He spread it out before the Lord, and he called out to God for help. And I want to read to you part of that prayer. It's found in 2 Kings 19, but just listen to me as I read it to you. Hezekiah said, It is true, Lord, that the kings of Assyria have destroyed all these nations, and they have thrown the gods of, those, of these nations into the fire and burned them. But of course the Assyrians could destroy them. They were not gods at all, only idols of wood and stone shaped by human hands. Now, O Lord our God, rescue us from his power. Then all the kingdoms of the earth will know that you alone, O Lord, are God. After that prayer, that very evening, alone, a single angelic warrior descended from heaven and destroyed the Assyrian army. 185,000 troops destroyed. The secular world, to them it is a mystery as they look back. They don't know why Sennacherib didn't take Jerusalem and defeat the nation of Judah. But God's people, we know the answer. We know the truth. This morning, I want you to recognize that if God can save Judah in such a manner as that, He can save us from anything. That's what I hope you grab hold of today. God can save us from anything. In fact, the first point of my sermon is that God has got our back. God has our back. That's the message of this psalm. The one and only, all-powerful, all-knowing God is protecting us in every way. He has set up for us, according to this psalm, a secure perimeter. The psalm calls it a refuge. But that's the only, not the only place that we hear about a refuge. Psalm 18, verse 2. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my Savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. Or Verses, few verses farther down, verse 30, God's way is perfect, and the Lord's promise prove, promises prove true. He is a shield for all who look to him for protection. Psalm 61, 3, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. Psalm 57, 1, have mercy on me, O God, have mercy on I look to you for protection. I will hide beneath the shadow of your wings until the danger passes by. This psalm really kind of starts us down this journey of recognizing that God has got our back. He, he is our refuge. He is a fortress. He is a tower. He is a rock. He is a shield. He protects us beneath His wings. These are all expressions of God providing a hedge of protection for His people. But there's more. There's more. Not only does He provide this hedge of protect protection, this refuge, this fortress, but He also empowers us with His strength on the inside. He protects us from without, but He also protects us from within. Isaiah 40, 29, it says, He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Amen for that. 2 Timothy 1.14 Through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. The psalmist reminds us that God has supplied us with an inner strength 
to get us through whatever trial, whatever storm, whatever struggle, whatever persecution has jumped on us. But there's still more. There's still more. The psalmist goes on to say that he is right there with us, always ready to help us, constantly and relentlessly watching over us. He is right here by our side. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. So I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? This psalm has spoke volumes to me this week. It is a reminder to me over and over again that God has got this. That He is a fortress. That He has empowered us to stand up under attack. That He is always with us. And that is great news. And I want you to understand, that news should change everything. See, God's strength has set us free. God's strength has set us free. You know, it's one thing to read God's Word. It's another thing to allow God's Word to take up residence in your heart and your mind. It's, it's one thing to read God's Word. It's a whole other thing to allow God's Word to transform your life. And that's what we need to do today. We need to allow God's Word to transform our life. Knowledge must be transformed into action. Knowing what God is doing must motivate us into growing. If God has got our back then there are some some things that we must be able to proclaim. We must be able to proclaim them. If God has got our back, we've been set free from fear. We've been set free from fear. The second verse in Psalm 46, so we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let me ask you a question, brothers and sisters. Is that how we are living Are we living without fear? The psalmist here in this text reminds us that even in the midst of uncontrollable disasters, where the power is beyond our ability to imagine, he says you should live without fear. You should live without fear. So I was studying for the sermon. I had to ask myself, is that me? Am I that guy? Am I the fearless guy? Or have I been letting a lot of things really push me into fear. On February 8, 1750, an earthquake quake rattled London. It rumbled and radiated from the southeast region of, of London and terrified the entire city. Not only did the building shake, but there was this reverberating noise like, like thunder that just encompassed the whole scene. Inhabitants struck with fear ran into the streets because they were afraid their homes were going to collapse on them and bury them alive. A month after that earthquake, Charles Wesley was preaching. He's preaching an early morning sermon when another earthquake came, far worse than the first one. Worshippers panicked, fearing their church building would collapse on them. People were screaming, children were crying. Wesley had the presence of mind to quote Psalm 46 with its dramatic imagery. We will not fear, though the earth be destroyed and the hills be carried into the midst of the sea, for the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. He later said that God filled his heart with faith and his mouth with words to calm and comfort the listeners. Ten days After that earthquake, another earthquake rattled the south coast of England, and a prognosticator predicted that an even greater earthquake was coming. His words were widely accepted, and people lived in fear. They camped out in the streets and in the city squares, afraid to go into their houses because they might fall on them. Multitudes turned to the Lord, thinking the day of judgment was near. That final predicted earthquake never came. But to reassure the people, Charles Wesley published two small collections of hymns that have since been referred to as his earthquake hymns. One of them is based on Psalm 46. 
He says in that hymn, God, the omnipresent God, our strength and refuge stands ready to support our load and bear us in his hands. That's the God we serve. The God who is ready to bear our load, to lift it, to share it, and to hold us up in his hands. 2 Timothy 1.7, we are told this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Brothers and sisters, we've, we've been empowered by God. The Holy Spirit lives within us, and, and that Spirit should empower us to live without fear. Our lives should be marked with boldness, not fearfulness. The psalm reminds us, if God's in control, you ought to live your life without fear. Another thing we've been set free to do is we've been set free to live joyfully. We've been set free to live joyfully. Verse 4 of our psalm, it says, A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. Now i got to back up a minute, and i got to talk about Assyria again. And there's siege around Jerusalem. Hezekiah realized that this attack was coming. He could see it as nation after nation was falling. And so he had the bright idea, a very good idea. He went and he dug a tunnel from a spring that was outside the city and brought that spring into the city. It was below the city, but they could access it from within the walls. And then he covered over the uh, spring on the outside. Now you can imagine if you are in fact the residents of Jerusalem as it is being sieged by the Assyrians, you can imagine how joyful you would be to know that you will not be without water. That you would be able to drink from this spring. It, it provided all the water they needed and plenty of it. That you would be able to drink from this spring. I want you to understand to be in the very presence of God, to know He is always with us and is constantly providing for us, that should produce in us a life of joy. We can always go to the spring, and not only can we go to the spring, but according to Jesus, the spring is within us. And that should bring joy. In fact, it reminds me of Philippians 4.4. 4. Always be full of joy in the Lord, I say it again. Rejoice. Remember, it says always. Not just when things are good, not just things are going our way, not just when we are riding the high. It's always, even in the rough times, be full of joy. Romans 15, 13 says this, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, even in the midst of the storms that are going on all around us, our lives must be marked by joy. Because God has got us. God has got us. <clears throat> There's still more. We've been set free to bring Him praise. You and I, we've been set free to bring Him praise. Verse 8 it says, come see the glorious works of the Lord. Let me ask you a question. Are we praising Him? We gathered here this morning, or let's say we gathered many places this morning, but we gathered to praise God. But have we praised God? Did we praise God this morning? Or did worries and stress and anger and sadness or anything else get in the way of that praise. No matter what life gives us, God deserves praise. No matter what comes our way, God deserves praise. If the rest of my life is marked with heartache and trouble, God still deserves praise. He has secured for me and for you and for all who accept it an eternity in his presence. And not only that, but he's got our back even today. He's got our back even today. There's a story of a church in an old town that was very sophisticated and dignified and quiet. 
One day a visitor showed up to worship with the church family. And when the preacher began to preach, he said something like, God is a good God. And the visitor shouted, praise the Lord. And everybody turned around to look and see who had shouted. The preacher also paused with a look of amazement that someone would respond to something that he said. The preacher went on to say that God has provided for us. And the visitor shouted again, Amen, praise the Lord. Again, everyone turned and looked at him. This occurred for several times during the service. Over and over again, he would shout out, Praise God, when something powerful the preacher said was proclaimed. But finally, someone couldn't stand it anymore, and they tapped the visitor on the shoulder, and they whispered, Please stop that praise the Lord stuff. We don't do that in this church. Praising God does not require you to shout out an affirmation during my sermon, although I'm sure that all of you at home right now have already been doing that from your couch or recliner. You've been shouting out, praise God! But it doesn't require that. But you know what? Praising God should mark every day of our speech. People should hear our praise of God everywhere, all the time, in all that we say. In fact, I couldn't pass by this point without reading to you another psalm. It's Psalm 150, the last psalm. This is what it says. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heaven. Praise Him for His mighty works. Praise His unequaled greatness. Praise Him with the blast of the ram's horn. Praise Him with the lyre and harp. Praise Him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise Him with strings and flutes. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals. Praise Him with loud clanging cymbals. And listen to what it says. Let everything that breathes, sing praises to the Lord. Praise the Lord. We need to be praising God with everything we have in every way we can and with every breath we take. That should mark our life. We've been set free to praise God. And we've been set free to live calmly. We've been set free to live calmly. Calmly. One more verse from Psalm 46, the 10th verse. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. Are, are we calm? Are, are we unruffled in the midst of all the upheaval that is around us? This verse isn't just proclaiming, now sit still and think about God. I mean, we probably do need to sit still and think about God. But this is a command to live confidently in God. To, to live your life without being frantic and overwhelmed. To live your life with the knowledge that God should be bringing calmness to your life. When we, we know that God is on your side, you should be able to live a calm unruffled life. The disciples were in a boat with Jesus out in the Sea of Galilee. Jesus was in the boat asleep. And you remember the story. A storm comes up. And it must have been such a storm that the disciples, one that they had never seen before because they were afraid that they were going to die. And so they wake up Jesus in this with this great worry and fear in their heart. Are you going to let us die, Jesus? Are you going to let us die? And if you remember, Jesus gets up and he, he just calms the storm. And then he looks at them and he asks them where their faith is. Why do you have such little faith? Why do you have such little faith? Listen, you and I, we, we may be in the middle of a storm right now. And you can respond with panic and fear and worry. And to be quite honest, I have and struggled with it and still struggling with it. But we have Jesus on our side. We have God right there with us. 
Where's our faith? Where's my faith? Where's my faith? Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8 says, But blessed, blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a river bank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. That's you and me. We should have a calm confidence in the Lord. Regardless. Regardless of what's going on around us. Regardless of what's going on in our world. Regardless of the situations in our own lives. Regardless of our health concerns. Regardless of any of that stuff. We should have a calm confidence in the Lord. Our demeanor alone as Christians should testify to the faith we have in Almighty God. God is with us. God has got this. God can do the impossible. God is protecting us from the outside. He is strengthening us on the inside. God stands ready to help us. And that must change how we live. It must be visible in our lives. Have we changed? Have we changed? Has our fear been replaced with joy and praise and calm. I want to end by reading you one last passage of Scripture. It's found in Romans 8. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since He did not spare even His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, won't He also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. God has got this. God has got this. Will you pray with me? Lord, we come this morning and Lord, I pray that Psalm 46 will transform our lives. I pray that the knowledge of knowing that you, oh God, have have got us, that you are on our side, that you are right there with us, that you can provide for us, that you will strengthen us. I pray, Lord, that all of that knowledge will transform our lives and we will live without fear and we will be involved in joyful lives and praising you that we will be calm, that people will see a transformed life in us and want to know more. Lord, I pray that whatever is getting in the way of that type of life, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you will help us weed it out of our lives, remove it from our lives, uh, throw it from our lives so that we can stand boldness, and courage, and confidence. God, I thank you for Jesus and what he has done for us. And I pray, Lord, that all of us, every single one, would realize that because of what he's done and because of whose we are, that we do not have to fear, but we can live trusting you. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.